Good evening. Thank you for watching. I'm Lea Hogg with our weekly current affairs program in English. My topic today is about the sharp increase in the spread of COVID-19 again. And we're joined straight away um, in the United Kingdom by Dr. Ron Daniels, who's been a regular guest on my program. Good evening, Dr. Daniels. Yes, good evening. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Nice to see you again. I have to explain to our audience, you're a specialist, a consultant in um, intensive care, and you're also Ooh. chairman of the Global Sepsis Alliance. And thank you very much once again. Uh, I'd like to ask you about the term long COVID that we've been hearing a lot about in the press recently. Could you give us an explanation about it? Well, of course, we've had an enormous number of sometimes very young people, sometimes very healthy people affected in a very small space of time by this viral infection. And what they're finding is that there is a long-term after effect. So people have had COVID maybe three months ago, two months ago, and even young, healthy people are still suffering. They're finding it difficult to go about their daily activities. They're finding it difficult to return to work. This is not really surprising to those of us who work in intensive care because we've seen this over many years in people who've survived influenza, in people who've survived sepsis of a normal bacterial infection. And this is simply about the long tail of infectious disease. What's happened right now is a lot of people have been affected very early. Thank you very much for that explanation. We're hearing also a lot this week about the T-cell immunity. Um, could you explain what that's all about? Yeah, so in the academic press, we started to talk about this back in, well, as early as April, really, of this year. And what we seem to have identified is that there is a huge crossover in immunity to previous coronaviruses. So an individual might have had a different coronavirus that they've been exposed to. They might not have even been that unwell. That's caused these T cells, these white blood cells to become activated and to remember that type of coronavirus. And there's some evidence now that that is also providing some immunity to SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. So there's a sort of crossover immunity potentially, which might be very good news. And it might be that that means that Actually, although we're seeing a lot of cases in terms of antigen testing, people don't seem to be getting, in general, quite as unwell as they were doing back in March and April. So you figure that we're sort of getting used to this uh, virus? Well, well, we don't know, but it's possible. I mean, we've seen, as you said at the beginning of the feature, we've seen increased number of cases across many countries in Europe and beyond Europe. And part of that is, of course, because we're becoming a lot better at testing people. But what we haven't seen is huge numbers of people now being admitted to hospital. You would expect a bit of a delay. So you'd expect to see that if the cases in the community started to increase, it might be 10 days before the hospitals got busy. But I mean, I work in the second biggest city in the UK and our hospitals remain very quiet of patients with COVID-19. There are very few new admissions. That's either because the virus isn't spreading and we suspect it is still spreading or it's because people aren't becoming as sick. And what about the second wave? Um, many countries such as ours, we're assuming that we're hitting the second wave. What's your opinion about the second wave of, of the coronavirus? So again, this is just my opinion. I'm not a virologist, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I work in intensive care and I see the cases coming into intensive care. In the UK, as in many other countries, we've had major gatherings two months ago, three months ago. We've had Black Lives Matter protests. We've had heat waves and people congregating on beaches. Our pubs have been open in the UK now for several weeks. Now, you would expect that that would have resulted in more cases coming into hospital right now, and it hasn't happened. So my belief is that we are not likely to see a big second wave, that we're likely to see a few parts of society that perhaps isolated very early on and haven't integrated developing COVID 
as they begin to get back into society, and we need to be worried for those people. But in terms of the big population, I can't see a big second wave coming along right now. What I think will happen is this virus will become endemic, and each country will see several cases every year. It will become, in that way, a bit like flu. Now, the condition is not like flu, but the way it behaves in terms of several cases every year, in the UK, several thousand cases every year, that might become a bit more like flu. And in your opinion, in the future, which would be the most vulnerable groups? So we know the vulnerable groups. They are the people with underlying health problems, particularly people with diabetes, the obese, and, 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 and so forth. So there are certain things there that we can modify in our behavior to reduce our vulnerability. Uh, vulnerability. What we can't modify is the fact that this disproportionately affects people from Afro-Caribbean and Asian backgrounds, the so-called BAME community. And I know that term isn't very favored at the moment, but these people, we don't know why they're disproportionately affected. It seems unjust and unfair. Is it simply because they're often in frontline work? Or is it because there's some genetic or dietary impact of their lifestyle that makes them more vulnerable to this infection? And I suppose um, as we go along, we'll find out more and discover more. Thank you very much. Good evening, Dr. Daniels. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. That was Dr. Ron Daniels from NHS Birmingham, a consultant in intensive care, and he's also the chairman of the Sepsis Alliance. With me today in the studio to carry on speaking about this sharp rise in COVID-19 cases is Professor Mark Brinkart, who's been working extensively on research and analysis since the first outbreak in Wuhan, China, I can say, right at the very beginning. And Professor Joseph Lee Curry, who's Emeritus Ambassador and a former permanent um, uh, representative in the Council of Europe in Strasbourg. Thank you so Thank much, you. both Thank of you, you, for joining us again today. Um, could we perhaps start from you, uh, Professor Brinkart? Uh, an update about Malta, Malta <coughs> and yes. the, the current situation in Malta. We see quite a lot of members of the public being alarmed mm -hmm. and some others being very unhappy about it and perhaps some mixed messages also from the authorities. Your opinion, please. Uh, well, of course, today we've had our, our association declare quite formally that um, they are not happy with, with mass gatherings. Now, we've got to remember where we started off from. Uh, once Wuhan uh, declared a state of emergency, they were building these huge hospitals in a week, <laughs> and the reason why one builds a huge hospital is to accommodate the number of patients. There was this flu-like illness, which was a res an acute respiratory syndrome um, uh, of sudden onset, that's why uh, SARS, um, that, that was leading to about, a, that has 10% mortality, and that's 10 times higher than an ordinary flu. Um, and of course, that was China. So we, we'd seen SARS-1, we said, okay, SARS-2, it would be confined. But it wasn't confined. It was, um, it was a virus that, that was derived from bats through some other vector. Um, suddenly, we see it on our doorstep mm -hmm. in Bergamo. Bergamo, which was one of the richest cities with one of the richest hospitals, well-trained staff, enormous resources, completely overwhelmed, people on ventilators um, with huge mortality. Once you're in ITU, once you're in an ITU case, you had a 50% mortality rate, if not higher. So the vulnerable groups were not really identified at that stage. Certainly there were young people who were being admitted as well. Um, but in general, the, as Dr. Daniel said, you had your hypertensive, your diabetics, your elderly population. But of course, Bergamo had its hypertensive, older population, pensioners and so on. Do and you so agree forth. with Dr. Daniels mm -hmm. about his opinion on the second wave? Yes, well, well this is where we started from. So, so obviously we have come a long way. I mean, I've been on these... Um, uh, webinars uh, of the, from the Department of Pharmacy for 15 weeks, and my job was to update. And, and there were changes happening throughout these 15 weeks. So, so fir firstly, you remember we had postponed this program by weeks. I said, this, this, if there's something going to happen, it's going to happen two weeks after we open our airports. 
by definition, a second wave is a wave where the virus is introduced from abroad because we had contained our own local spread quite well. We were down to four cases, you remember. Um, sure enough, bang on target, this week, no sooner had somebody declared that we, we, we're not going to panic just because we have one extra case, we had 70 cases and 40 cases. And, and, and these are large numbers by our standards. Now, one of them was, and they were undoubtedly associated with mass gatherings of one sort or the other, be they a party, be they a, a, a feast, or be they immigrants stuck on a boat or being stuck in a reception center in Libya. Same as mass gathering. This is a highly infectious disease. Now, right now, we, are, we don't have admissions to hospital because these are young people who have been affected and they have been controlled. So the, this second wave, and I think we are in a second wave now by definition because it's, it's introduced from overseas, the second wave is contained. Um, but it has not hit, just like the first wave, it has not really hit our vulnerable population. So it's all very well for us to say, yes, great, our ITUs are not full. And my colleagues' ITUs in my <coughs> medical school, which is King's College in London, which had gone up from 50 to 150 ITU beds with a huge mortality, is no longer in such a state. The, the numbers have gone down drastically, even though there are pockets here and there and in the UK, in Yorkshire and Leicester. Um, but, but the ITU beds are not filling in. Now, do you define a second wave by numbers of cases or by numbers of deaths? This is the argument. Certainly in the States, we still see horrific results. And this is because of a lack of lockdown and a lack of effective treatment. In Europe, the situation is much more under control because we have learned big less good lessons on, on, on how the virus behaves, on treatment, on use of ITU appropriately, on not necessarily putting everybody on ventilators, and, uh, and testing. I think so. Testing and lockdown are very important until the vaccination comes along. Mm. May I ask, um, yes. Professor Likari, um, the medical aspect, we hear a lot about it. What are the political implications and how is the world? Can we say we're at the post-COVID stage because we're still in the COVID stage right now, but how is the world going to change? Uh, look, political. Uh, I don't mean political in the party political sense, mm. but politics in the sense of the organization of the state the nation state, what systems uh, the state has. As we have just heard, in Malta we have a health system. A hundred years ago we had the Spanish flu, we had no health system, people were dying like flies. Now we have this virus coming from China, nobody was expecting it, nobody was prepared for it, but the system held. We had doctors, uh, nurses, uh, administrators, knowledge, and they were quickly able to cope with such a crisis. It was an emergency, but they coped. Uh, so it is important to have a health system, and what we have learned from this crisis is that even in future, the health system has to be well financed, well taken care of, and even when in future governments will be inclined to make economies, they will not make economies on health because we have realized more than before that the system needs stocks of medicine and of equipment. So we have a health system that's important. And to have a health system, it needs to be supported, it needs to be financed by an economic system and we have an economic system too. Now, obviously, it has been like a war. It has been an economic crash with uh, lots of people being in lockdown. So consumers don't buy, uh, shops don't sell, uh, manufacturers don't produce. <coughs> we are now seeing the statistics showing that uh, national production in France, Germany, the US, during those three months, April, May, June, uh, national production has gone down by 10%, 15%, 20%. That's an economic crisis. But we have an economic system to, uh, to face up to the challenge and to be able to react positively by subsidizing consumers, 
subsidizing the wages of workers who are out of work or on two day, three day uh, work week, uh, the profits that companies and enterprises are no longer getting. And of course, we have seen the central bank, in our case, we have the European Central Bank, which cut interest rates to, to a very, very low level and has taken other measures to throw money, literally throw money uh, into the economic system for the money to circulate and for the economy to be stimulated. Now, th these things have not happened in every country. They have, uh, uh, they have occurred in developed countries, including Malta. Health system and an economic system which are solid. In your opinion, has the European Union taken enough measures to control this pandemic? Yes, uh, the European Union has taken a big step in the direction of becoming a state uh, by, uh, by in its own right. I have to say from the first that if Britain were still a member of the European Union, the Union would not have been able to make such a big stake, step because Germany especially and France and everybody has decided that the Union had to react as a Union and not a single state. So the European Union has decided to uh, borrow 700, 800 billion euros, a huge amount of money, and which it will then distribute or redistribute to individual countries in the form of loans or in the form of grants, giving uh, to the most vulnerable countries more than to the rest. So you're going to have a transfer of funds from countries like Germany to countries like Italy. Italy will be benefiting, which is why they took such a long time to agree on the measures, because you're actually give, transferring money. You do it out of solidarity, but not only. You do it also out of self-interest, because it is in the interest of German industry that Italian consumers continue to buy German products. Sure, that makes it sense. is in the interest of German industry that Italian companies continue to produce the spare parts that are used in Germany. It makes a lot of sense. It does make it a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense, but it's politically difficult. And one thing we have to bear in mind, in, the, in, in individual countries and in the European governments have reacted well at the expense of increasing deficits and debts. And all these we have to pay back in future. Yes. So it is likely, it is inevitable, that in future taxes of some kind will increase. They have to. In fact, what governments are they doing is they giving money today, which they take back. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. <coughs> Professor Brinkard, I'd like to uh, ask you about the imported cases, uh, the yes. testing at the airports, and also um, the imported cases through the irregular migrants. Yes. Um, your opinion? Let, let me please. first say that the reason why many countries were successful in Europe in dealing with this was because we had a, a division of labor and everybody worked together. Uh, very often we lose a lot of time and effort, even you can see this locally, with a sort of winner-take-all scenario. And we cannot have a winner-take-all scenario. We can't have one no, big boss no. anymore who's a warlord and everybody else does what he says. No, and as, as we get factions, and, and this concerted response would not have happened. So there was goodwill, there was a crisis, everybody came together. And the same applies for when we come to airports. Now, 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 the whole idea here was to open the tap slowly to get economic regeneration, as opposed to opening the floodgates. This is not an all or none situation. This is a progressive situation. Now, you remember here, we had advocated that once we open the airports to the hotspots, to the countries which still have disease, then we would have liked to see some form of testing. We have been overcome by events now because Germany, in fact, is offering, service, uh, offering testing services on landing. 
here, there's a lot of voluntary testing by people who are landing. Hence, we've had the sudden flood of requests. We've gone up to 10,000, you know, requests uh, for testing, which is all, all done on the NHS, by the way. And these are, in, 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 in many cases, a lot of foreigners I'm who are landing. I'm being told that we're, uh, we're running out the of time. <laughs> I'm being told we're running out yes. of time. Well, so Can it's we just very that, quickly... That, that very if Germany is testing everybody who's landing, yes. we have to decide where they test at the okay. point of departure or we test when they land. Can we just very quickly close about the, mm. the imported cases through the migrants? Right. Just very briefly. Well, because I, yes, I, 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 I don't, yeah, the, the, of course, migrants are a big problem, but just imagine what's the problem we've got in Libya. When we talk about politics, and politics is a big P, is Libya, a problem that maybe Europe created, maybe the states created, created by themselves. We can't carry on blaming ourselves. But certainly, you cannot negotiate with one lord, warlord and expect the entire you know, place to stop sending migrants. We have a big humanitarian problem. We have to decide. Either they don't leave and we help them, or they leave and we help them anyway. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you very but much. But having over 50% of a migrant of a boatload landing either here or in Lampedusa who are infected with probably a different variant of a virus is quite a serious problem. They are confined. They are Thank quarantined. You. And, uh, we'll Thank you very much. The time runs out very quickly. I'm with Professor Mark Brinkart, Professor Joseph Lee Curry. I'll see you very soon.